My name is Maureen Pace, and I'm the president of the World Trade Center Dublin. We're delighted to be hosting this event today. The World Trade Center Dublin is part of the Global World Trade Centers Association. Our fellow World Trade Centers are located in 100 countries around the world. Together, we work to support businesses looking to grow their global footprint. I want to thank the World Trade Center Mumbai for being our promotional partner for this event today and welcome their members who are with us. What if you're not prepared for Brexit? Well, today we have the experts with us who are going to provide you with the vital information to ensure that you will indeed be ready. I wanna thank these presenters. Dr. Ray Nulty of Brexit Partners, who is an international business expert and authority on the current status of Brexit and helping businesses to maneuver through the transitions. Mr. Archie Reed, Partnership Manager of Clear Treasury, who will be discussing FX strategies, planning, and understanding international payments. Mr. Martin Dubby, Managing Director of Herod Associates Global Investigative Solutions, who will be moderating for us today. I wanna remind each of you that if you have questions, which I'm sure you will, um, please um, put them in the QA box, which you will see at the bottom of your screen. With that, I wanna thank everyone once again for joining us today, let you know how delighted we are to be hosting this session. And I'm gonna turn it over now to you, Martin. Thanks so much. Thank you, Maureen. And wherever you are in the world, a very warm welcome from me. Uh, my name is Martin Dubby. I'm based in London and uh, I'm delighted to be sharing the platform with Ray Nolte, who you've heard is an uh, expert on uh, the Brexit process, and Archie Reid, who will be giving us some really insightful uh, understanding of the, the uh, currency markets as it stands at the moment. I think it's fair to say that wherever you are in the world, if you deal with the UK, uh, life is about to change. Um, your dealings, your handling of issues to do with the UK, it will change come 1st of January. And in some respects that applies around the EU as well. So we're delighted to be unpacking some of those issues this afternoon. I should give a bit of my background. I joined the UK Customs Service in 1979. Um, that is too young even then to remember the days of pre the EU 1973 when uh, customs were still stamping the paperwork that we're going to be enjoined to uh, uh, prepare as of 1st of January come a deal or no deal. Um, as I say, life will change and we'll be unpacking those and answering your questions during this session. As Maureen said, there's a Q&A section at the bottom, but to open up before we go to our speakers, we will throughout this presentation be taking a poll of you regarding issues to do with Brexit and would welcome your cooperation. So can I ask for the first question to come up, please? So how prepared is your organisation for Brexit? If you just click on one of those and press submit, then we should get the answers up on screen very shortly. Okay, well, that's, thank you for those answers. So 8% um, of you fully prepared, uh, that's good. We've got some optimists and fully prepared people on the, uh, on the webinar, that's great. Uh, somewhat prepared, but intend to do more, 54%. I, I think that's probably a category most people will put themselves in. Hopefully you'll pick up some uh, uh, clues and suggestions as to how else you can prepare during this uh, webinar. Um, We'll adjust once final changes are clear, 31%, obviously really important. Um, again, I don't want to steal Ray's thunder. I'll turn over to you in a minute, Ray. But, you know, just the comment here that still, even now with something like 28 days to go, we still don't know if this is a deal or no deal. So on that introduction, Ray, can I turn over the floor to you? And uh, thank you for your presentation. So I'm going to talk about um, what's happening uh, from a political point of view, what's happening in relation to preparation, what sort of things we need to do over these next 28 days and, and beyond, and fundamentally what 
challenges, breaks it's going to pose uh, for our organizations. Um, when you reflect on the scale of impact of Brexit and compare it to the COVID, there's quite a lot of similarities. And in some cases, um, the impact, impacts of uh, Brexit are even worse than COVID. Uh, we'll talk about later on. But just like COVID, Brexit's a contagion, which is a incredibly efficient and spreading from host to host. It's all very well if you believe that you're well prepared for Brexit, as we've seen in the, in the survey. But unless public infrastructure is ready, unless your suppliers or customers are ready, uh, you'll be infected. And there's nothing you can do about it uh, uh, unless you have had sufficient time to prepare and mitigate those risks. Um, you're also finding that people, which should be employees, customers, or whatever, are actually feeling socially, legally, and economically more vulnerable. Uh, you know, we've seen people who left the UK market because they don't feel <clears throat> that they can actually continue to work there. Um, there's changes in employment um, regulation in terms of overseas working, people working in the UK. There is new procedures to allow people to work in the UK. <clears throat> and Brexit as, a, as an initiative has made, you know, non-nationals feel quite vulnerable in the UK. And you know, the sort of uncertainty and anxiety that we feel with COVID, uh, we'll also feel that with Brexit, uh, some more than others. But I think that's going to increase as the uh, transition period ends. I mean, I must remind us that you know, Brexit has happened. Uh, we're going through a transition period which allows almost the status quo to continue. But just like uh, COVID, you know, we've seen this thing coming. But a lot of organizations haven't done anything about it or they haven't done enough about it and there's a lot of worry about the implications of that um also we're seeing you know lately that uh many think tanks economic think tanks and specifically uh belong to governments or independent ones are actually saying that the economic implications of brexit are much greater than uh, covid for those countries obviously who are, who are directly impacted uh, just like COVID, we'll see disruption to supply chains. Uh, we'll see strain on public infrastructure and finance, not just in the UK, but uh, within the European Union and potentially within organizer, within countries which um, are pretty dependent on the UK market, which aren't within the European Union. We'll see travel restrictions. We'll see counterfeit and fraud increasing as, as we have for COVID. <clears throat> Certain sectors will be impacted by, more than others. And whilst you know, we've seen the tourism sector, for example, impacted by COVID and the grocery industry, for example, flourish. Um, we will see that retail sector, particularly the grocery sector, impacted quite dramatically by uh, uh, once the transition period has ended. And likewise with COVID, you know, we saw which was going on in Wuhan, but we had actually a much greater run into Brexit and we can predict what was going on, but we've been pretty late in preparing. So there's some very interesting uh, analogies there. So as of today, um, we are no better off knowing whether a deal is going to happen or not. Um, you know, we were supposed to have a deal in the middle of October, uh, and we were told that was the latest period at which um, a deal could be agreed because it needed to be ratified through uh, the various parliaments uh, within Europe, the European Union and, and the UK. One has to assume that there's no such thing as a no deal because in any no deal, arrangements will have to be made to normalize the relationship between uh, the two blocks. And you know, from a timing perspective, um, it will be difficult to put anything through uh, Parliament. We may come up with a deal between the European Union and the, uh, and, and the United Kingdom in the next few days, but actually physically getting it through, uh, well, maybe if there's a will, there's a way to do it. But the chances are that um, any deal or the ratification of that deal could run into uh, January or February even, where you'll have a period between uh, of no deal to deal. <clears throat> but the trouble is, when we look at a deal itself versus no deal, a deal is very thin. And um, there's a lot of stuff we could have prepared for now. And even when we look at how we'll operate under a deal, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of preparation required. There's a huge amount of disruption. From a government perspective, um, 
Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel is German Chancellor, saying time is running out. We don't have, we will don't, we won't do a deal at any price. We're seeing um, the various governments who are probably nearest to the UK um, looking to trigger no de deal preparations. I mean, the Irish government are looking to do it this week. Um, Netherlands, France, and Belgium have been calling for that for a while. Uh, Michel Barnier, the EU negotiator, is um, saying that EU contingency planning has to kick, uh, have to kick in, plans have to kick in uh, by Thursday. Um, and um, what we're saying, so there's a lot of political movement, and I, I guess a lot of countries are very worried about the position they'll find themselves in as a result of Brexit, and they don't want to give anything away. And so this is becoming quite a fraught, quite a difficult uh, issue. Um, from a, an economic point of view and from a business point of view and security and geopolitical point of view, uh, it makes sense for a deal to happen or some form of deal to happen. Uh, if we look at it from a UK perspective, there are significant sectoral exposures, you know, financial services, manufacturing, car industry, and, and so on. And you know, we've seen security and policing chiefs um, uh, flag up warnings about cooperation uh, on, on these particular areas uh, with the European Union as vital to Britain's security. Uh, and then we're also seeing they, um, you know, if the UK um, doesn't uh, stick to the Good Friday Agreement and changes the um, uh, legislation shortly, uh, that will create issues for a trade deal with the, with the US. So, you know, even that in itself, uh, that potential le legislation um, could result in uh, a no deal actually happening because, uh, I mean, Europe has, has said it would walk away from the table. And I think Brexit itself, um, you know, comes on the tails of COVID-19 and, you know, the need to create economic recovery um, means that, you know, politicians are kind of pushed to work together and countries work together to, to ensure those issues. Um, are addressed. I think when you look at the you know, independent bodies in the UK, for example, the uh, government's uh, office for budget responsibility, you know, they're, they're saying that there's a very significant uh, geo, GDP impact from Brexit, you know, percentage, 4% of reduction in GDP. Um, we look at the, the, the impacts where there's an no deal later on, but that's very significant and that's greater than, than COVID. And what we're seeing is that um, when we look at the technical issues, the technical requirements uh, managing trade, whether it's in goods or products, um, the trade deal that will be agreed will be extremely basic. And you know, if there's a free trade deal, it, it still doesn't mean that it's going to be frictionless. There's going to be a lot of administration, a lot of core costs, a lot of delays. And uh, what we'll look at later on is that the UK and public infrastructure from other nations isn't ready for this. So even if we do strike a deal, um, there's no guarantee that relationships between the two blocks will remain cordial, um, particularly in the areas of uh, divergence on rules and regulations. And, you know, there is a, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've heard uh, from the political side is about, level, you know, maintaining a level playing field. And um, the chances are that if uh, one block moves away from the other, that it could re result in economic retaliation. And this could be on anything from product certification to whatever. Um, and then the, EU, you know, uh, the EU, EU faces specific challenges and pressures to make a deal. I mean, it doesn't want anybody else leaving it because of the impact on the budget. In fact, the UK's contribution to the EU budget has been extremely large. Uh, and there's concern that, you know, Hungary and Poland, for example, are in uh, negotiating deadlock over the, the, the next budget. And, you know, the European Union will want to maintain a stable union and a stable um, uh, euro currency. And the Bank of England, uh, uh, during, it was last year, produced some uh, figures on the impact of a Brexit on UK GDP over the next 15 years. And uh, at the time, they said the probability of a no deal was about 50%, and the GDP implications were negative 9.3%. And then uh, if the UK got World Trade um, Organization most favor na na nation status, the implication would be a negative uh, uh, point, uh, minus 6.7. And as I've indicated, the OBR have indicated if there is a deal, there's a negative implication of, of 4%, which is a lot. 
Um, could we go to the uh, my first poll? Uh, so overall, how positive or negative do you expect the impact of Brexit to be on your business? Now I'm aware that there are um, people here from uh, outside of, of the European Union, and later on we can take questions on the implications of those countries. For example, we know the uh, World Trade Center in Mumbai is there, and I can give specific views on the implications of, of, of Brexit for, uh, for example, Indian companies or any overseas companies. Um, so this is a, you know, a global issue, not just something which is uh, related to the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom. So there are some people who believe that um, there will be some positive opportunities. Um, actually, there are. And I think one of the criticisms we'd have is that organizations haven't really looked for opportunities out of that. Uh, negative 19% is, is, is or sorry, negative is uh, 31%. Uh, I don't know is 31%. Uh, I'm not sure we've got two negatives there where it is, but uh, overall, I think the um, position is it's not a good thing for uh, the global economy or indeed individual uh, countries. So uh, moving on. So when we look at the difference, when we look at deal or no deal, um, there is, uh, irrespective, there are a huge amount of implications. Um, for example, in exporting, uh, the UK government, in, for the UK alone, reckons us between 150,000 and a quarter of a million companies who will need to make uh, customs declarations for the first time. Uh, they've also revised the estimate of the number of customs declarations that may be necessary to process on a no deal compared to current processing volumes of 250, 270 million. And the cost of processing those declarations uh, at a minimum cost of 20 pounds 20 pounds each would mean that the cost is uh, 5.4 uh, billion, I guess. When we look at Brexit from a technical perspective, uh, and we're not going into this in much detail, you know, we're seeing uh, regulatory issues, and I've listed down some of the regulations here, and I'm sure this presentation will be shared to members, but these are the critical regulations, and uh, they're quite in-depth and quite take quite a lot of time to, to study and to implement. There's quite a lot of process changes, uh, which you've indicated there, uh, lots of technology changes, um, and a lot of registration requirements. And these uh, requirements um, are required irrespective of whether there's a deal or a no deal. Um, you know, we've been working with organizations who have taken literally years to prepare for Brexit. Uh, and it's been, you know, they've had very large teams stood up to deal with it. Um, and, you know, you can't underestimate the uh, training uh, changes that are required. But as I said in the first slide, uh, when we looked at, you know, the, the difference between COVID-19 and Brexit, you may have done all of these changes yourself, but if your customers are impacted and they haven't made the changes or your suppliers or your supply chain aren't ready for it or public infrastructure isn't ready for it, um, then whilst you've made all these good changes and your program has progressed well, you will be uh, uh, impacted by Brexit. If we look at the UK economy and government preparations, um, the UK um, Audit Office has produced a report, and these are some of the points from them, which effectively says that UK government, UK public infrastructure um, is not ready for Brexit. Uh, the systems aren't ready, the ports aren't ready, uh, all the people that are required to be in place aren't there, the training hasn't been completed. Some of this is down to uh, COVID-19, some of it's probably down to uh, delays and change of the government and the change in leadership uh, in the Conservative Party in the general election. But fundamentally, the UK economy has some uh, very uh, significant um, issues to address in being ready. Um, and even contingency plans uh, for, uh, for Brexit, while some have been going on, they haven't been uh, uh, tested particularly well. Uh, now, if we assume that the UK economy, uh, the UK government has been doing quite a lot of work, which they have, and they've produced a huge amount of incredibly useful material, which people need to look at. And if you're in other countries, your own governments have probably produced it or, you know, look at the European Union. It's a very complex issue. And, you know, whilst there are issues with government preparation, uh, we're seeing, particularly in the SME sector, um, a very low level 
of uh, participation and preparation uh, for, for Brexit. Um, when we look at the business preparation, if we compare to where we were uh, for the original Brexit deadline, we had stockpiles built up. We don't have those stockpiles anymore because of COVID. You know, we've got limited warehousing capacity in the run up to Christmas. Uh, supply chains are, 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 are strained and there are issues in, in distributing goods because of COVID. And uh, there are, you know, uh, many organizations have built up cash uh, reserves. Those cash reserves are no longer there. So um, there are significant issues uh, with it within UK preparation. I think if you're looking at this from a, you know, a senior executive or board of director perspective, um, you know, there are specific strategic economic customer issues which need to be addressed. Uh, ideally, you should have modeled what the implications are. We're finding that many organizations really haven't entered into commercial negotiations with their with the suppliers or customers in terms of the economic or margin impacts of Brexit. Uh, contingency plans haven't been tested. Not enough risk assessments have been undertaken. Uh, lots of organizations haven't addressed their contractual exposures. Uh, and unfortunately, they won't be covered by their contractual, by their contracts to uh, treat this as a uh, frustration of the contract. Um, and the list go, goes on. Um, what I would um, turn your attention to is that the FRC, um, when they wrote to um, audit committees and finance directors last year, uh, they outlined a number of specific areas that organizations had to cover. Um, and certainly on financial reporting, uh, they were, uh, they were uh, encouraging organizations to disclose what the implications of Brexit were on their organization. And the SEC and other regulatory bodies followed suit. And I just did a, um, I've put down here a, a number of excerpts from the financial reports from a, a number of organizations who've actually reported on the implications of Brexit. And we've seen here that there are issues around product certifications you know, moving from BSI UK to uh, um, other BSIs and the issues around the CE mark. Uh, so Avenger there have reported on that. Uh, we see that Lakelands Industries have reported that customers are less confident on economic growth and that's been reflected in their own markets and their own investments and uh, uh, having to respond to pricing from competitors. We've seen the same thing in the retail industry. We've seen uh, Apergee Corporation report their concern about delayed deliveries uh, on their internal supply chain, not just their external supply chain. Uh, we've seen other organizations talk about the issues around divergence on regulations, not being able to find substitutes and not being able to find uh, the, uh, new suppliers to, to address those. Uh, interruptions on uh, imports and exports. Um, we've seen from uh, uh, catapult therapeutics um, and the list goes on. Um, we've also seen that um, organizations finding it difficult uh, in the future to share employees and equipment across borders, well, across the border between UK and, uh, and the European Union. Uh, we've seen GDPR issues um, uh, once uh, transition is finished. We've seen uh, the um, airline industry being impacted by open sky policies and issues, uh, implication for uh, testing of vehicles and divergence on uh, regulation in the fuel economy testing and emissions area. And uh, we've seen other issues in terms of um, effectively insufficient preparation by individual market participants, suppliers, market ecosystem, uh, et cetera. So a lot, a lot of issues there, which I, I would certainly ask you to take a look at. Um, the final poll, um, has the pandemic impacted your preparations? Um, so yes, it has for a lot of organizations. We see 27% significantly and 36% uh, moderately. Um, and that follows the examples I gave earlier. Just in terms of the, um, uh, what you need to do, you know, what, what would a life boat, boat drill um, uh, be made up of? And these are services which we've developed with uh, Webport Global and the World Trade Center. Um, you know, we do organ we recommend organizations to do a health check on what are the what are the big strategic issues, what are the big risks, and where you've identified those, it's worthwhile doing a, a very quick impact assessment to see whether you can mitigate those. Um, I think one of the areas where uh, Webport Global World Trade Center can help very much is on alternative source sourcing uh, and contingency planning, trade compliance gap analysis, which uh, could be an issue. 
AEO accreditation is really important. I saw a figure for the Irish agri food sector uh, yesterday, which said only 17% of firms had actually applied for this. And the benefits of AEO accreditation are actually really important. Uh, also, you should be looking to see whether you, you um, should be looking at alternative supply chains or alternative marketing, uh, et cetera. So these are services which can be deployed very quickly, and I think have major benefits for, for individual organizations. I also suggest you take a look at our website uh, because we have a lot of material in there which you can draw on, which will explain what the issues are. And uh, last but not least, uh, my colleague John Shuttleworth has created a really useful uh, book on um, the post Brexit transition, what the regulation is, and the, the key areas you need to focus on. So it's a, it's a concise summary of, of, of all the issues. And then finally, you know, from a lifeboat drill perspective, um, you know, is our boat in danger of sinking? Um, you know, lifeboat drills are a critical part of operation. This, this should be a critical part of your operation, assessing what the impact of Brexit is. And, you know, we need to make sure that our people are appropriately trained to operate in this emergency situation uh, in the run up to it. And we should be testing that, but particularly for the hundred, first 100 days afterwards. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, most lifeboat drills are done in still waters or before a ship goes out. Um, we really need to simulate uh, and make sure that we're actually test or testing for um, some of the economic and some of the disruption issues that are there. Um, so thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. I'll hand over back to you, Martin. Thank you, Ray. That was excellent. And just a reminder, this material will be supplied to you direct uh, after the presentation. Uh, so now it's my great honour to introduce Archie Reid to you all uh, for his perspective on uh, the financial markets. Thank you, Archie. Hello. Hi, Martin. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ray. There was lots of good stuff there that you touched on. Um, I think, yeah, some of it I'll, um, I'll be touching on as well. But yeah, certainly from, from my perspective, I'll be speaking about the currency markets, um, but also, you know, how Brexit will, will affect the currency markets and, of course, about um, clear treasury. Um, so, yeah, first of all, um, I just want to share my screens. Then I also want to start off with a poll. Excellent. That is fantastic. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I guess um, I'll just kick off um, just starting first of all. Um, so yeah, delighted to be speaking. Um, we're a, a World Trade Center member um, over in Dublin. Um, so yeah, I, I'll be speaking probably for about maybe 10 minutes about the business. Um, and then I'll also finish off um, discussing the impact of Brexit um, on currency markets. And, you know, I guess that, that affects all of, well, everyone who's listening because, um, yeah, if you make an international payment, I guess you'll be very aware of um, how much you know currency fluctuations can can affect your business. Um, so, slide. Okay. Um, so yeah, first of all, I'll just go on um, who we are, um, what we do, um, the benefits to you um, and your clients. Um, we, we work with the World Trade Center, who are who are a good partner of ours. Um, so there's also um, met many people that refer to our business as well. Um, so, so just a little bit about us um, as a company. Um, so we began in 2010. Um, we're fully F FCA regulated um, with offices in Dublin and London. Um, I think, um, yeah, we, we've, we've traded um, over four and a half billion now. Um, we've, we've grown year on year. Um, and yeah, I think, um, sort of the, the next market for us is um, Dublin. Um, we're, we're sort of doing a lot of work over there at the moment, partly because of Brexit, um, but all of our accounts are um, held in London, in, in the UK. Um, yes, yeah, so there you go, there's, there's our London and uh, Dublin office. Um, so what do we do? Um, so yeah, these are the three main areas where we help uh, companies. Um, the first is FX strategy, um, which is really important. So when, I'm sure now it's good that I know that most of you um, are involved in, in exchange rates and, and making international payments. But very simply, we facilitate, um, just like a bank, um, we facilitate international payments. So there has to be an exchange, so from one currency to the other. Um, and it's, it's as straightforward as that. 
payments we can do as well. So um, if you um, want bank accounts in different um, currencies, um, so sterling, euro and dollar are the, are the main three that we do. Um, if you want a bank account in your name, then that is something that we can provide. And then our final thing is uh, API integrations. Um, so that's essentially a, a technology price feed that we would um, plug into any platform. Um, so what do we actually do? Um, so first of all, the, the probably the most important thing that we do is, is give people uh, a free financial health check. Um, so that's just very simply where we, we'll find out um, what your currency exposure is throughout the year. Um, how much you're looking to do, whether you have peaks or troughs. Um, it, it completely varies on your business. The businesses that we deal with can be incredibly varied. Um, so some will be small SMEs that are doing maybe turning over 100 or, or 200,000 pounds a year, all the way up to mid cap corporate businesses doing 100 or 150 million uh, turnover a year. Um, I think, you know, I think we've all seen this year how much currency markets can, can move. Um, and so we basically look to take away the stress of dealing with um, financial markets and in particular the currency markets. Um, how we work with partners. So a partner to us is someone like the World Trade Center um, or accountancy firms or um, SME lenders. Um, so that's people that can refer um, clients into us. We, of course, want to align ourselves with those types of businesses to help their clients. Um, so that's something that the majority of our business comes from that. Um, and, and referrals as well. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great value add service if, you're, uh, if you have clients that, that are making international payments. Um, so why us? Um, I know there's a lot of um, banks and, and other types of services that, that, that do a very similar thing. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of um, TransferWise or you know, um, companies like that. Um, so all, all we do is minimize um, the, the transactional costs when you look to um, move money abroad. Um, we can do this very simply by just benchmarking the pricing. Um, so banks, most banks will make money in two ways. Um, on the, the exchange rate that they give you and also the um, amount of money that they charge for the wire transfer. Now, initially you think um, wire transfers are, you know, annoying, maybe it's 20, 25 pounds, but you know, if you're making 10, 20, 30, 50 uh, a month, that can obviously add up to, to a significant amount. Um, and then the exchange rate is, is in essence the, the hidden fee, um, which, you know, that's what, where banks, particularly UK banks, Irish banks are slightly better, um, but yeah, in general, um, Irish banks um, uh, can be slightly better, but we'd still be saving probably anywhere between one to, to 3% um, are, are on your FX transactions. Um, so yeah, this is basically what we do in, in sort of a more direct way. Um, so yeah, first of all, we'd come in and understand the business. You know, sometimes there'll be businesses that are paid after 30 days, 60 days or 90 days. Um, however, the FX markets can move a huge amount in, in the time when you raise an invoice and when you actually get paid for an invoice. Um, so we can minimize that risk um, as and when you um, when you need to do the transfer. Um, so that's that's something that's that's really, really important. Um, so how clients work with us. So how does it actually work from a from a, um, a physical perspective? So very simply, you, you open a line, uh, an account online and that would usually take you maybe five minutes. Um, once you've opened your account, your account is then good until cancelled and it will sit there until until you use it. Um, then very simply, you'll be uh, assigned a, an account manager who, who would look after you. And then that's, that's pretty much it. You're, you're ready to go. Um, we charge no other fees apart from when you look to um, make, a, make a payment. Um, so what do we need from you? And probably the best, best place to start, um, data is always really important. Um, so if, we, if you have any sort of historical exchange rates, um, that you've that you've done in the past 12 months um, obviously 100% of you have made uh, international payments so that's great um, if you can just send us when you made the payment how much and what currency then we can work out what we've been offering um, at that time um, and then I think as well a really important thing for us to understand is a your profitability when you trade overseas because you know I'm sure we all saw over the pandemic um, you know, sterling, I think, fell on average of, of, of 12 or 13% um, in March. So 
I know uh, Ray was talking about, you know, what, what would be the, the economic impacts or um, tariffs, etc. I think the average WTO tariff is anywhere between 10 and 15 percent. Um, so if the FX markets have moved that in, in well, essentially one month, of course, it was an extreme month. But, you know, that that's goes to show how important getting your um, your FX is uh, is absolutely key. Uh, so this is what our, our payments platform looks like. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, here you'd have your, your dashboard, um, which would show you the, the currencies that you have. So this is the dashboard and there's your, your currency accounts and um, what you have with us on file. Um, if you want to exchange or, or look at statements, etc., cetera, um, then it's all there for, for you to see. Um, it's very straightforward. You can manage your payments 24 seven. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's uh, all fairly self-explanatory. Uh, yeah, we trade 55 currencies as well, um, and we can send to 130 countries. I think it's more than that now, actually. I think it's 150 uh, countries um, across the world. So where do we add value? Um, and sort of how are we able to offer um, the exchange rates that we do? So it's a very simple business model. Um, we have a couple of banks that we use in the UK um, to provide our liquidity from. Um, in essence, because we're doing such large volumes, um, they give us a price that's very close to the interbank rate. So uh, the interbank rate is, for example, if you Google um, sterling US dollar, um, let's say at the moment it'll be 134.60. We buy just below that um, because we're doing such high turnover. And then our clients would buy just below that, where if you're a, a business and you just go straight to um, the banks, or even if you're, you're a retail customer, um, of course, they give you a much worse exchange rate um, because, unfortunately, they, they, they can afford to. Um, and yeah, due to low overheads, um, we're able to provide very, very low uh, margin. Um, but yeah, so it's a very low margin, but very high turnover business. Um, and then, yeah, one of the, the key things that, that we offer is market access. Um, so if you have, let's say, uh, a, a raft of payments coming up over the next 30 days, in essence, all we do, uh, well, well, not myself, I, I'm in sales, but our traders, all they do pretty much half seven till six at night, um, they're just watching the markets. So if you want to achieve a particular exchange rate um, in a particular currency, um, you can say, okay, for example, on sterling US dollar, I want to exchange when it hits 135. They would watch the markets up until that point. If you want to go ahead, they'll give you a call and then they would, um, they would book you in. Um, so that's, that's like a really important service because banks just unfortunately don't offer that. Um, I have countless clients that, that like to pretend that they, you know, watch um, the, the currency markets themselves. But, you know, unfortunately, if you're, if you're a di director of a business, I think you've got a million and one other things to be thinking about um, other than the, uh, the currency markets. Um, so yeah, just in terms of the, the payments and the, and the payment um, gateway that we've constructed, um, we do same day settlements um, to abiding to global cutoff times. So most of our major currencies, um, our cutoff is 2 or 3 p.m. Um, so if your funds are with us by 2 or 3 p.m., then we can get uh, the payment out on the same day, which is obviously great and pretty essential for most businesses. Um, and I think, yeah, just, just being fully FCA authorized is absolutely key. Um, so in, in, a, in the worst case scenario where we were to go um, into administration, all of your funds are kept separately um, in, a, in a client segregated account. Um, so, and we bank with Barclays. Um, so if the worst case scenario did happen, all your, your funds would be ring fenced, um, but we are debt free um, and we've, we've never borrowed any money, uh, which, is, which is always positive. And we've always grown or, organically as well. Um, so yeah, so just to go on the couple of products that we have, so yeah, I've already covered um, dedicated dealer and online platform. Um, so there are three main products that we sell. Um, a spot contract is same day, pay now, pay later. Um, limit orders, market orders are very, very straightforward. Um, essentially, they just offer you a targeted rate. So let's say, for example, you wanted to target 140 on sterling US dollar. Um, just very straightforward. You just have to... Um, wait until that exchange rate was available and, and that would happen. And then forward contracts are where you fix an exchange rate for a certain amount of time. And then um, what, what, when you have a payment to make, um, you can draw down on that contract. Um, so yeah, if anyone's more interested in that, that's uh, absolutely fine. Um, I'll just 
just worried about time, so I'll just do a, a case study um, for, for one of our clients. Um, so this was a law firm um, with several international offices around the world, um, exchanging a var variety amount of currencies. Um, their current bank, they were banking with uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, they offered no help at all. Uh, all payments were done online. You had to just go on and, and, and book the payments yourself. I'm sure many people are familiar with that. Um, and couldn't speak to anyone over the phone. So just a really poor service. Um, so yeah, we reviewed their currency risk um, and minimized that where possible. And most importantly, compared uh, the bank's pricing. Um, so I think they are only doing, give or take, two, about two million pounds worth of currency a year. And we were able to save, um, yeah, over, uh, well, pretty much $33,000 a year, uh, which is pretty good. Um, I, now I'll just skip to, the most important thing, and obviously, you know, what, what people are worrying about at the moment uh, here in the UK. Um, but yeah, I mean, the geopolitical risk is, is obviously dominating market sentiment. Um, I think, well, I'm, I'm sure many people saw um, after the, the June referendum um, in 2016, sterling uh, fell 12% that day against the dollar, um, I think 10 or 9% against the euro. Of course, it's going to be uh, a negative thing for the euro as well. Um, but in comparison to the UK, the, the effect is far greater. So that's why we see um, sterling move so much. But sterling at the moment is, is very, very highly exposed until um, a decision is made. Um, as Ray said, you know, if, if things continue um, to look uncertain, then naturally we'll see sterling weaken off. Um, I think we've all seen that happen. Um, and we're just hoping that, you know, once sterling gets out of this pattern and hopefully there'll be some sort of certainty come come january the first then we should see sterling um re recover um so i'm just going to go to my next one um yeah so just putting it into perspective there um you know obviously because of covid uh, our jet debt to gdp ratio now is, is very high uh, it's over 100 percent for the first time since world war ii um, which is obviously pretty bleak, that will not help sterling because ultimately sterling is, is valued on the value of, uh, of the UK economy. Um, investor appetite is, is weak. Uh, I think we've seen, you know, particularly over the, since COVID, so uh, for the past year or so, investment into the UK has been pretty poor. Um, and yeah, the UK economy is still pretty much 10% smaller than, than pre-pandemic levels, um, which yeah, is obviously very, very tough. Um, and then we can just look, I mean, the, the last thing that I wanted to um, highlight to you guys is um, just the currency swings that we've seen in the last five years. Um, you know, if you look at here at, at the top, sterling US dollar was almost at, above 1.5 um, just before the, the referendum. And then we look at the um, after when the coronavirus shut down the UK economy, we ended up at 115. Um, you know, so that's a swing in, in a matter of years of almost 30%. Um, so the, the one thing that we always say is, is protect your margins where possible. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all our business does. Of course, we make international payments. That, that's something that's straightforward. But um, yeah, I guess the, the most important thing, and if you want to speak to us, um, is just to, to protect your bottom line. Uh, yeah, so thanks very much. Um, I'll hand back over to Martin. Thanks very much, Archie. That was excellent and a really good insight to perhaps some of the concerns that are coming up on the on the rates uh, over the next, well, uh, by my calculation, 27 days, 27 yeah. days to go. Now, um, we did ask earlier, if you've got any questions, please do put them into the Q&A box. Um, we will endeavour to get as, through as many questions as we can in the next uh, remaining part of the session. Uh, so please do let me have your questions. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll kick off uh, and ask Ray, uh, in the light of your, uh, your message to everyone, have you invested in a new freezer? What <laughs> actual practical concerns do you have uh, in Ireland for, for the consequences of Brexit? Well, no, I haven't invested in a new freezer. Um... We tend to buy local, organically produced food and stuff that's in season. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the issues for Ireland are the uh, dependence of the economy on the UK market, particularly the SME sector. And certainly some of the discussions I've had with um, government and particularly with the financial services industry is that uh, Brexit could bring on 
an induced um, economic crisis because of the lack of preparation or the impact on the SME sector. So, um, you know, uh, while certain, like whilst the financial services sector will do very well, I think indeed Northern Ireland will do well. Um, there are still a lot of issues to be sorted out within the Republic of Ireland and uh, too few organizations have, uh, for example, taken the services of Webport Global, the World Trade Center, to uh, take a look at alternative markets. So prognosis in the, in the short to medium term isn't good. Okay. In the light of that, Archie, what do you think that will do to the rates? I mean, it's it's difficult to know um, exactly where they'll end up. But I mean, the, the projections that, that we've done as a business, um, I think if, if there was to be some sort of no deal, then yeah, we, we'd certainly, sterling euro would probably fall close to parity. Um, I think sterling US dollar would probably go to, to 1.2. Uh, 1.22 is, is kind of the, the furthest we, we'd see it fall. But I think it's like Ray said, you know, if, if negotiations continue after um, January, then sterling will never truly recover to sort of, you know, pre-2016 levels because if, if it's ongoing and, you know, things are uncertain, then the currency is always going always gonna to struggle um, until, you know, until the, the, the uncertainty um, disappears, basically. Thanks, Archie. And, and Ray, coming back to you, Obviously, you know, that we'll have colleagues online here outside of the EU thinking, well, this doesn't really affect us. I, I mean, what about our colleagues in India? Um, you know, in a snapshot, what, what should they be thinking about? What should they be concerned with? Well, I, I guess there is no trade agreement between India and the European Union or one between uh, India and the United Kingdom. So the emergence of that will be quite important. Uh, but more specifically, um, the UK is the EU gateway for India. Uh, there, I think UK, um, there's about 15 Indian financial services firms with headquarters in, in London, and their ability to trade with your opinion Union will be curtailed. There are about 800 Indian firms from other sectors working in the UK, and the vast majority of those trade with the European Union from uh, the UK. Um, and I, you know, the UK's economic position is going to be impacted by both COVID and Brexit. And currently, India is the third largest, so UK is the third largest source of FDI for the Indian market. You know, particularly healthcare and the agri sectors are really important. Uh, Brexit directly impacts on the Indian stock market due to the high volatility of the pound and the state of the UK economy. Uh, and I think the, the euro and the pound sterling accounts for about 24% of the rupees effective exchange rate. So um, with Brexit firm por portfolio investments will outflow and likely to weakening of the rupee. And I think there will be an another concern from a customs perspective in particular is that we don't, we certainly anticipating in the short term that there will be some pretty chaotic supply chain arrangements in and out of the UK whilst people adjust to customs paperwork. Uh, there's certainly indications that people just simply aren't ready for this. Um, and the level of paperwork confusion on the French side, uh, confusion on the UK side and other ports around uh, Europe, that this will have a significant uh, impact on the movement of goods into the UK and then out again. Uh, so it's definitely worth taking advice on that. Uh, and perhaps a concern that Perhaps people think, well, I'm just shipping my goods to the UK, it won't affect me. But our concern in the short term would be that you get caught up in a logjam or backlog of, uh, uh, of trading uh, activity uh, ahead of you. And that, that log jams your trade as well. So do, uh, do take early advice with your agents on that and make sure they are prepared uh, on that front. Ray, big, um, big question, uh, obviously, is the Northern Ireland border between, uh, between you and the North. Um, what's your view on how that's going at the moment? Again, a lot of confusion at the moment, isn't there, over what the relationship will be with this part of the UK, as it were, uh, and Ireland? Yeah, it is. It's extremely complicated. Um, it's kind of one of those situations where there's a lot of opportunities for Northern Irish firms. And I think if I was going to establish a, a firm in Europe to access both the UK and the European market, I'd probably I'd seriously consider Northern Ireland. 
but there are huge complexities being, you know, because Northern Ireland straddles European Union and the UK. Um, I think the delays are going to be quite significant. I think we also, I think also it's been uh, compounded by COVID with the higher rates of COVID and uh, the need to control people moving as well. And I think because, uh, you know, the, the core systems, uh, custom systems aren't ready and there's an amount of uh, mistrust over, was it TSS? Uh, by you know local traders as well um, looks doesn't look great at the moment from a just purely physical uh, transport of, of goods back and forward. So I think I've I've heard it said in the past few days that the UK is ceding Northern Ireland to the EU. Would you agree with that statement? <laughs> I. I don't believe it is, but uh, it's not something I've looked at particularly. I haven't looked at. The <laughs> Uh, and what about, Ray, with uh, a number of these issues coming up? You mentioned in your presentation the health check. Why, why would you recommend that? And, and perhaps, Archie, you were talking about your health check as well. I'll bring you in in a minute. But, but Ray, why do you think at this stage a health check would be useful? Um, I think uh, if you haven't, I mean, a lot of organisations have said they won't do anything until a deal is there. And my view is that's nonsense. We know the implications of a deal, you should be checking for that at a minimum. The difference between a deal and no deal, a deal for, for example, the movement of people or goods is known. And, you know, um, I think it's foolhardy not to address those issues because it takes a while to deal with them. I think on a more strategic level, um, Brexit, uh, depending on which country you're in, could have an adverse impact on uh, your funding, uh, your uh, business model and your strategy. I think it's really important to take a look at it. I mean, uh, I, I think people have been sleepwalking towards this. So this is just a very fundamental requirement. Um, yeah, I think, I think from our perspective, you know, there's been so much, um, so much movement in, in the FX rates um, over the past, you know, essentially three, three or four years. Um, I think we, we say a financial health check is so important because there are two things. First of all, to protect yourself against volatility is really important, but also the, the very base of our business is, is you know, give, giving cheaper exchange rates. Um, I think it's such a it's such a waste and a shame to, to pay more for, you know, at the end of the day, currency is just a commodity. Um, so, you know, you should always look for, for the best price. Um, and that's something that we can offer. So, um, yeah, I, I guess the, the more people that get in touch, you know, we, we may or may not be able to help, but I think the more people that get in touch and at least check um, that, that they are getting a fair deal, then um, yeah, I think that's that's all that we can all that, all that we can offer. Great, thank you, Archie. Um, I'm just conscious of time. I, I just wanted to thank uh, both Ray and Archie for their time uh, this afternoon. It is a fascinating um, subject. Obviously, I've said 27 days to go, so do think about your health check. Please don't sleepwalk into it. We uh, were advising a uh, quite a complex trader uh, in Europe about setting up in the UK and with all the customs procedures that have to be gone through. And then they have to buy in the softwares that you need for the customs procedures and everything like that. And don't get me wrong, they're well financed, they're well organised, you might think. Um, but to get the softwares in alone and to get the approvals in, we estimate are going to take almost a year. So have left it too late and they have effectively sleepwalked into that into that problem now that whatever happens with the deal for them they're going to have big trading problems and uh, you know there's a mountain to climb now whereas yes you could forgive them perhaps for earlier in the year thinking let's wait and see and everything like that but the problem is is everyone is now demanding the same services the software companies are under a lot of pressure to supply the customs process procedures. And um, at the same time, your application still has to be approved by HMRC. And I understand similar pressures are, are coming on in, in Europe as well. So again, uh, you know, I, I would encourage you, don't, don't sleepwalk into the uh, uh, next few days. On that point, perhaps I can turn back to uh, Maureen and thank everyone at World Trade Centre for uh, allowing us uh, the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Perhaps, uh, Maureen, I could turn over to you to close. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, um, for 
for for moderating and um, and certainly the information that was shared um, from both Ray and Archie is invaluable. And I know that there are many, many more questions um, that people, you know, wish to ask, um, and we just didn't get to. Um, so, you know, if you have questions, um, you know, for this esteemed group um, that you would like us to share with them, we're happy to put you in touch um, so that you, you can talk with them yourselves. Um, trust is, is so important to us um, in the World Trade Center community, and I can tell you um, firsthand that whether it's Brexit partners, Clear Treasury, or Herod Associates, these are our trusted partners. Um, and they share with us information and advice on a regular basis um, that help us to service our, our clients. So, so I thank you all. I thank you all for your time. Um, this was wonderful. We will be, um, we will have the recording um, that we'll be posting um, and sharing. So um, if there's anything that you missed or you want to share with other colleagues, you know, please feel free to do so. Um, we have some very exciting new initiatives coming up in 2021 um, for our clients. So stay tuned um, and we look forward to keeping you updated. Um, stay safe and uh, happy holidays to all. Thank you very much.